All right, it looks like we're at 4 p.m. Eastern time, so we will go ahead and get started with our undergraduate admissions webinar series for the Faculty of Engineering. And this webinar is focused on chemical and nanotechnology engineering. Um, so my name is Daniela Cross. I am the Associate Director of Marketing and Undergraduate Recruitment here at the Faculty of Engineering. We have a wonderful group of panelists lined up for you today, and I'll be getting them to introduce themselves in just a moment. Um, just a reminder that we're using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. It'll pop up a Q&A box where you can type in your questions. So please feel free to use that. We'll try to get through as many of your questions as possible today. I would also like to start us off with our University of Waterloo acknowledgement. So the University of Waterloo acknowledges that much of our work takes place on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. Our main campus is situated on the Haldeman Tract, the land promised to the Six Nations that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. Our active work toward reconciliation takes place across our campuses through research, learning, teaching, and community building and is centralized within our Indigenous Initiatives Office. Um, later on, if you do have questions following the webinar, I would like to ask that you email us at nginfo at uwaterloo.ca and we can direct your questions appropriately from there. And please do visit our website. Um, there's lots of great information there as well. All right, so if our uh, panelists could go ahead now and please turn on your video and unmute yourselves. I will ask each of you to introduce yourselves and then uh, we will get started. Okay. All right, if we could start off with uh, Professor Marco Coyne, please. Hi everybody, uh, I'm uh, Marco Coyne and I'm a professor of chemical engineering. Uh, I've been at the university for 13 years uh, and now I'm actually the chair uh, of the department. Um, and uh, my research focuses primarily on uh, biological aspects of chemical engineering. And so uh, it really deals with uh, the pharmaceutical industry. And um, as a result, we've been very active uh, during this pandemic time as we do uh, research related to uh, the, the pandemic. So I'm very happy to be here and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Daniela, you're, you're on mute now. Thank you, rookie year. Uh, thank you so much, Mark. Tizazu, could you introduce yourself, please? Sure, thank you, Daniela. Uh, hello, my name is Tiz McConan. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering. I've been at URLU for a little bit more than three years now. My research is focused on polymer science and engineering, more into the sustainability aspect of polymer science. So I work with, uh, you know, utilizing renewable resources to produce polymeric materials uh, and also recycling and reprocessing the existing materials, recovering value uh, from polymers as well. Uh, I'll be very happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Wonderful. Valerie, will you introduce yourself, please? Hi, I am uh, Valerie Ward. I am um, a professor as well, assistant professor in chemical engineering. I joined a couple months after Professor McKinnon there, um, so about three years now. And um, I work in uh, biological areas of chemical engineering as well. So my primary focus in my research group is to uh, figure out biological ways to produce chemicals more sustainably. And we particularly like to use microalgae to do that. Sometimes we produce things like proteins for more pharmaceutical applications. Um, and sometimes we produce things like lipids to make biodiesel, um, for example. Excellent. Thank you for being here today, Valerie. And Dylan. Hi everyone, uh, thanks again for attending. Uh, I'm Dylan, I'm a second year PhD student in the chemical engineering department at Waterloo. Um, I study um, plastics engineering, uh, more so the sustainability and circular economy of how we can reuse uh, recycled materials and uh, value added products to uh, minimize waste accumulation and to uh, find alternative solutions to uh, petroleum based uh, leading resources. Um, 
That's, uh, yeah, that's about it. If you have any questions uh, from a PhD student perspective uh, in research and balancing uh, extracurriculars or uh, other life aspects, uh, feel free to ask me some questions. Excellent. Thank you, Dylan. And yes, I think we'll get into some of that, um, how you balance your workload and extracurriculars and, and life as a graduate student. That's a good topic to cover. Thank you. Um, can we go to uh, Ting next, please? Hi, everybody. My name is Ting Xu. Um, I'm associate professor in chemical engineering, and I'm also the director of the nanotechnology engineering program. So I've been uh, to Waterloo about 13 years, I think the same years uh, as uh, Mark started, almost to the month too. Um, so before I came, um, came to uh, Waterloo, actually I spent 10 years in the industry. Uh, primary focus is in integrated circuits. I work for Texas Instrument in Dallas, Texas, and also work for AMD in Sunnyvale, California. Um, so I'm kind of a cheap person. I kind of uh, sleep on silicon most of the time, dream of silicon for many years. Okay, so you have any questions in the IC, that's uh, my view. Awesome, thank you, Ting. Uh, Suman, will you introduce yourself, please? Hi, I'm um, from Nanotechnology Engineering in 2013. Um, right now, I'm working as an editor at Nature Publishing. Um, before I started, student working on carbon I specifically platform. Suman, Suman, sorry to interrupt. I think we're just having a little audio issue with you there. Um, so I'll, I'll just get us to try to fix that in the background for a moment. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, I, I have headphone issues sometimes, sorry. No problem. I'm so sorry. So if you don't mind introducing yourself again, that would be wonderful. You were cutting out. I apologize. Sorry. Um, so my name is Sumin, and I graduated from nanotechnology engineering in 2013. And I'm currently working as an associate editor in at Nature Publishing. So before I started my career in scientific communication, I was a graduate student working on um, carbon nanomaterials for biomedical application. So I worked on developing um, platform for drug delivery using carbon nanotubes um, and also um, carbon nanotube hydrogels. So I'd be happy to answer any question um, related to um, career options after nanotechnology engineering and also um, anything biomedical. Wonderful, thank you so much, Suman, that's great. And we also have two undergraduate students from the nanotechnology engineering program joining us today. So Emma, could you introduce yourself, please? Sure, um, I'm Emma, I'm a 4B nanotechnology engineering student. Um, and I chose nano to study at Waterloo because I really like research, but I didn't know when I was entering exactly what field I wanted to pursue. Um, and because our classes and co-op opportunities in the program are so multidisciplinary, I was able to explore different fields. And through that, I've determined that I'm most interested in electronics and microfabrication and intend to pursue graduate studies in that next year. And much of my research through co-ops thus far has been in perovskite solar cells, which is important for development and renewable energy to tackle the climate crisis. Excellent, thank you, Emma. And I know we'll love to hear a little bit more about some of your co-op placements um, later on in the webinar. So we'll come back to that. And Kingsley, will you please introduce yourself? Hey everybody, uh, my name is Kingsley. I'm actually in Emma's class. I'm also a 4B nanotechnology engineer. Uh, I chose nano primarily because I also didn't really know exactly what I wanted to do, but I knew I loved physics, chemistry, math, biology. Um, but over the years, I kind of made my research interest in using biology, like using biology biomaterials to uh, integrate them with novel nanomaterials and electronic devices. Uh, so one of the co-ops that I recently had was working in um, using DNA as a means of molecular data storage. And then in this term, I'm working uh, with another professor at Waterloo to develop a COVID biosensor. Um, and of course, being an undergrad, I'm living and breathing it every day. So I'm happy to answer any questions about the undergrad experience. 
looking forward to it. Fantastic, thank you so much. So just a reminder to our participants, please feel free to type in your questions using the Q&A button. We'll try to get to as many of those as possible. Um, and we've got a few questions already to get us started. Um, so the first question that we wanted to ask was, how do you feel that chemical engineering or nanotechnology engineering um, engineers and even researchers and students are helping to solve the challenges caused by the pandemic? Um, so I, I'm gonna ask Mark to start us off. And if anyone would like to add to Mark, please unmute yourself and then I will go over to you once Mark is done. Well, engineering as a whole has, has really uh, shown uh, promise for uh, helping uh, during these pandemic times. But in chemical and nanotechnology engineering, we've done everything from developing sensors, uh, as Kingsley uh, referred to, uh, to diagnosing, uh, to uh, looking at uh, how to protect uh, people from uh, the virus. That includes looking at uh, um, detecting um, the virus in wastewater, all the way uh, to um, generating vaccines and creating vaccines. Um, as engineers and as chemical engineers, you know we we uh, we definitely work with the transformation of materials uh, and uh, building of materials. And today, nowadays, that includes um, building from biological blocks. And so, uh, for example, in our group, uh, we're actually um, working at building up uh, novel vaccines um, based on um, essentially uh, the information or the 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 code uh, that uh, that 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 um, uh, that defines what life is. And so, you know, we we manipulate DNA and we uh, work at the genetic level to uh, generate new particles that can be actually utilized um, as, as a vaccine. And not only that, as, as chemical engineers, we're very much in uh, the realm of, of producing materials. Uh, and so, you know, I, I once said when I first started here at Waterloo, I wasn't in the business of, of creating new vaccines, I was in the, the, the business of making sure that that vaccine was available um, for as many people uh, as possible. And, uh, and we continue to do that to this day uh, in that we look at large scale processes to make sure that uh, we are able to um, get that vaccine uh, or that uh, drug uh, to the people that need it. And let's face it, I mean, we are facing a time where, you know, we are looking at trying to vaccinate the entire world. That's a lot of people. And that's what chemical engineers uh, can, can help to do. Wonderful, thank you, Mark. Tiz, did you wanna speak about your research a little bit and, and your area of expertise as it relates to the pandemic and what you've been working on? Sure, uh, thank you, Tanya. Um, Yes, so the COVID-19 challenge, it brought us all together uh, from different perspectives. As Mar Mark uh, pointed out, chemical engineers are involved in not only, the, I mean, the scale up is probably one of the primary roles we have in that process. Uh, once the vaccine is created, how can we produce it at a large scale uh, enough to supply to the globe, right? The, the global population, that's a major task. In addition to that, chemicals, chemical engineers and uh, chemical engineers at Waterloo uh, were involved in different aspects of it. Uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Professor Bill Anderson, has looked at uh, the use of UV radiation to disinfect uh, PPEs that will help us to mitigate some of the shortage, the shortages we had um, uh, early on, right? Uh, that shortage is not, we still have that shortage, not only in Canada, but across the globe. Uh, so what we, me, what our team tried to do uh, with my collaborators is to look into uh, gloves. So when you talk about PPEs uh, that are related to COVID, we have the masks, the gloves, and you know uh, several uh, parts of it, right? So probably uh, all of us heard about uh, the mask challenge we had, you know, Canada as a country and uh, the politics surrounding 3M and the US, right? Uh, but we have 
very similar story on the glove aspect as well. Uh, the current gloves that we are using, so glove use, use has increased tremendously as a result of COVID, and that created a huge shortage in the market. Uh, and not only shortage, on the other hand, we use it once and throw it away. It's designed in such a way that it will be used only once. So that created a huge waste that will be landfilled or uh, incinerated, which would both have environmental uh, concern. So what we did in my group is, what will happen to gloves if we try to disinfect them and reuse them? Is it even possible? Uh, actually, I have a personal experience where I walked into a Walmart pharmacy and I asked for gloves and they said, oh, no, they cannot sell any gloves. Uh, they have to disinfect their own gloves and use it multiple times. Is it even safe? Nobody knows the answer. And we checked the literature. Nobody looked at that. So we, uh, we studied that uh, right after you know, uh, the COVID lockdown uh, relaxed a little bit, and, uh, which allowed us to come back to the lab. So we evaluated um, two types of medical grade gloves. Uh, that's the nitrile, you know, the colored uh, blue gloves, or it can be in green color as well. The other one is the latex glove. Uh, uh, scientifically, we call it it's a PVC based glove. Uh, so we took we take the two and using simulated um, experiments we evaluated uh, six approved disinfection methods so physical methods as well as chemical methods and we also looked at how many cycles of disinfection uh, uh, would affect the property so we went uh, from one time disinfection all the way to 20 times uh, disinfection to see uh, if we can disinfect gloves and uh, reuse them uh, that study uh, led by uh, the, uh, my team members, uh, Dylan, a PhD student, is here on the call. He can uh, comment on it as well. Uh, all of us were involved in the work. Um, and uh, we, we observed very interesting results, actually. Uh, uh, at, out of the six disinfection methods we looked at, at least three of them does not affect the gloves substantially, even up to 20 times uh, disinfection. So um, even though this experiment is uh, on a simulated environment, it's, it sheds um, light on what we can do in the future to reduce the amount of uh, our glove consumption. Uh, and uh, we plan to continue our work on that. This work is currently published as a peer, um, uh, on a peer-reviewed journal article. And uh, Dylan may, may have a few points to add. Thank you, Tiz. That is so interesting. And I'm looking forward to reading more about that soon. And, and Dylan, did you want to add um, to what you've been doing in, in your work with Tiz? Um, the only thing I'd like to add really is uh, that just to expand a little bit is that engineers, uh, they really just, we really just seek out uh, to find alternative and better solutions to existing and current problems for like the betterment of society and civilization. So that's really everything, that's really what drives us in the back of our mind and when we face either an acute or a long-term issue. Awesome, thank you, Dylan. Yes, engineers solve the really tough challenges. And Valerie, I think you might have something to add to that. Yeah, I just wanted to add that like, um, chemical engineers can play a big role in also ensuring you know that vaccines are produced reproducibly, that they're safe, their quality control and all that kind of stuff. They're, they're involved in a lot more roles than just the, maybe like the design part of, of the process. So in all kinds of different areas within. And definitely when the pandemic hit, a lot of my colleagues from my postgraduate work, they all went, left academia to go work for Moderna to make the vaccine <laughs> for them. So it was definitely a high demand skill set at that time. <laughs> And it still is right now, I think. <laughs> Most definitely, thank you. Um, Ting, would you like to speak a little bit about nanotechnology and how um, nanotechnology engineers are doing work to help solve the challenges of the pandemic as well? And if, if anyone else wants to add to that, they can also chime in after. Sure. Okay. Now, um, most of you guys will know that two active vaccines right now, one is from Pfizer, one is from Madora, and and the technology itself is actually based on nanoparticles, is actually using a lipid nanoparticle actually to encase the mRNA. A lot of people don't realize that this actually, this vaccine is a perfect example of what the nanotechnology outcomes is. 
for many years that net people just say, hey, what's the product for nanotech? But this is actually the, 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 the shining star of the outcome. Uh, if you look, take a little bit closer, it's all about nanotech. It's actually create a lipids particles such that you inject in the body, uh, the body is not going to destroy it until it get into the cells and then you release to the cells uh, to the, with the RMA unit. So this is what actually what drive the current vaccines, at least for the two type of vaccine available right now with uh, like 95% efficacy. So, so this is actually a perfect example on how nanotech actually contributes in the COVID-19. Um, in addition to this vaccine, actually um, this type of nanoparticle strategy has been developed at least like three years ago from other type of disease, but it's less popular and that's well known. So um, the technology itself is exists and just so often uh, these two vaccines become the shining star of the outcome of the nanotech. And um, just kind of uh, let you know, we in our nanotechnology programs, <coughs> excuse me, I'm getting too excited. <coughs> we do have a lab such that student, students can play with them. Uh, nanoparticles and also uh, PCL devices. The PCL devices is one of those devices that can, you can rapidly uh, detect the virus and the DNA inside. So when you're in a nanotech program, you will actually have hands-on experience in these two areas. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you, Ting. Yeah, Sorry. <laughs> um, and Emma, Kingsley, Suman, did any of you want to add anything to either the work you've been doing through your co-op or Suman in your current role now, how you've seen nanotechnology engineers really making a difference during this pandemic and, and the work that they do um, impacting, you know, positive results and making positive change? Um, I can add. I was really happy to see um, the things that I learned from class and labs really apply to um, vaccine development. Um, most of the platform technologies are now based on nanotechnology. Um, and also um, most of the biomedical stuff with the nanomaterials really um, help to deliver um, the therapeutic molecules or vectors in a stable form. Um, right now, I really saw um, significant increase in the tension in how nanotechnology can apply to um, delivery of drugs, but as well as um, designing protective devices as well, um, like masks. Um, people are using um, something like microneedles and nanoneedles structures or hierarchical structures to filter um, viruses to protect us from some of the um, pathogens. So that's one of the, um, one other neat application of the nanotechnology. Excellent, thank you so much, Simon. Okay, we're gonna move on a little bit. Um, we've been receiving a few questions about the differences between biomedical engineering, chemical engineering, nanotechnology engineering. So I'm wondering if maybe Mark and some of our other professors could expand a little bit on your definition. And then I'd love to hear um, from Emma and Kingsley as well, from a student perspective, sort of where you see the differences lying. Um, so Mark, did you wanna kick us off um, with your take on sort of the differences and what might compel someone to become a chemical engineer versus biomedical engineering and, and where the differences are with nanotechnology engineering? Well, um, scale is one thing. Uh, when you're talking about uh, nanotechnology, you're really talking about uh, looking at um, going down almost to an atomic le level. So you're really looking at, at how um, things work uh, at that small um, uh, of a... Of a Well, you're just really studying it at the atomic level, sorry. Um, whereas in chemical engineering, you really are usually um, looking at things at a, at, um, at a scale that um, allows you to um, target a larger audience. So, so um, when, you're, when you're thinking about um, 
I am, I'm, 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 I'm dumbfounded in terms of, of trying to explain this. Um, but I think, I think of chemical engineering really as, as process related and how you can actually get uh, and transform materials um, to a, a wide audience. And everything stems from that. Now there, there are different um, aspects of it, but, but really at the core, we, we tend to think about it in, the, in that way. Biomedical engineering here at Waterloo is very focused on technology for the medical sector. Uh, and a lot of it is uh, computer related, not completely, but, but heavily emphasized uh, on, on computer skills that will develop um, tools uh, for the medical industry. And I think Ting probably can talk uh, a lot better about nanotechnology, but uh, that, that, that would be my take on it. Okay, thank you, Mark. Ting, did you want to give your take a little bit more on the, some of the differences or comparables between those programs? Uh, sure, okay. Um, um, as Mark already mentioned, um, the scale is makes a huge difference. So uh, for nanotech, basically we're dealing with objects from 100 nanometer and smaller, uh, from nanoparticles or nano tube or nano wires. Um, so, but eventually we need to see scale up to a much uh, larger manufacturing uh, in order to make a lot of it to make money. Um, that's the most important thing. Um, so, um, so to some degree, the nanotech, we also will learn a little bit from the chemical engineers. Uh, in fact, the um, nanotechnology um, and uh, engineering program is composed of three different disciplines. It's a multidisciplinary program. Uh, one is chemistry, the other one is chemical engineering, and then finally is electrical engineering. So it's actually is a three different components. So for example, as I mentioned before, uh, nanotech is the, the great driving force for the current vaccine. So it's a bio uh, applications, but again, um, it also drives in terms of uh, integrated circuits industry. So for some of your, the audience may be also interested in uh, the integrated circuits, the current technologies, uh, the transistor is down to five nanometers. So there are a lot of features you can make it really small, and that is also can be related to the bio uh, interactions. Okay, so um, so that's another big area: how the small scale, how nanoscale objects going to affect uh, how cells behave. Um, so this is another big area in terms of uh, nanotechnologies. So it's a combinations between a chemistry, electrical engineering, uh, and also in uh, chemical engineering. I hope make it clear rather than confuse more people because I'm, I talk no, about I think I think that was really helpful, Ting. And we actually did have a question come in um, asking if you had to go sort of a biological aspect or route um, versus like satellite communications and that type of thing. And it sounds like with nanotechnology engineering, there are many avenues that someone yes. can go into. Yes, um, our number is going all different sectors. Um, uh, a good portion go into electronics industry because it's big. Um, and then uh, a lot of them go to biofuels and such as uh, pharmacies, drug deliveries um, or vaccine development that we've seen. Um, so it's also a, uh, a nanotechnology sectors. Excellent. And Ting, I had another question and um, if Suman or Emma Kingsley, if you want to jump in too, um, are there any applications or could you give some examples of how nanotechnology engineers may work in the environmental sector or help the environment through the work that they do? Um, can you think of anything that might apply? A question came in about that. Um, I would let Arma answer that. I think she have experience in that area. Yeah, so there's a lot of different applications and research of ways that you can help the environment. Like two of the my, well, I guess three of my co-ops have been in fields that could be considered environmental. My first one being in um, the synthesis of iron oxide nanoparticles for cleaning terrestrial oil spills. So environmental remediation is a big one. And a lot of nano students work on water treatment. And then I've also, as I had talked about, done work in solar cells. So that's in renewable energy aspect of helping the environment. So you can really be in environmentally focused research from the aspect of electronics, more just a nanoparticle filtration sort of aspect from water treatment, or there's probably biological applications as well. 
Excellent. Thank you, Emma. And Tiz, you mentioned some of the work that you're doing as well in chemical engineering through research. There is environmental impacts. Could you expand on that a little bit and maybe give a few more examples of work that maybe some of your colleagues are doing or students to help the environment through chemical engineering? Uh, definitely. Uh, yeah, chemical engineering is such a broad discipline. Uh, I would like to put it as, you know, chemical engineering deals with converting raw materials to products, uh, be it a vaccine, you know, you have the initial formulation, but if you want to produce it at a large scale, you have to involve chemical engineers in the process. Uh, if you are uh, talking about plastics or any uh, material, a generic material, uh, chemists probably come up with uh, the initial uh, structure and formula, sometimes you go down there and help the chemists as well, but typically we start with the formulated or the initial structure and how can we make it available at a large scale in a specific shape that's comfortable and easily usable by uh, the public, uh, that's what we deal with. Now, uh, my research has to do a lot with environmental aspects um, in a sense of materials and polymers. Uh, so uh, as we all know, the plastic industry lately is associated with environmental, uh, several environmental concerns. Uh, so the health aspect of it, uh, the waste accumulation in the environment, in the production process as well, most of them are derived from hydrocarbons, from petroleum. So all of this needs some sort of a solution. So one would be, uh, what, what can we replace the petroleum feedstock with something natural uh, that's sustainable that we can grow every year for instance agricultural feedstocks forestry feedstocks uh, or something that we can um, produce using our bioreactors you know professor Ward is an expert in that uh, here and we work together in some projects along those lines so uh, we try to do that we have uh, some successful um, uh, products out there that are derived from natural uh, resources, natural feedstocks. So food packaging is one example. You know, Single-use uh, uh, bags is another challenge that we are trying to solve. Uh, actually, Canada is in the process of banning single-use plastics. If it is banned, what's the solution, right? So we deal with that a lot. What about the already produced plastics? You know, the uh, for instance, car tires. We cannot avoid using tires. It's again made from mostly from synthetic uh, uh, feedstock. So, can we recycle it? Can we uh, convert it to something else? or at least repurpose it, right? Uh, one of my colleagues in our department, Professor Kostas Zuganakis, has developed a technology to uh, recover it back for uh, uh, another tire again. So continue, the cycle continues, right? Uh, so we have that kind of uh, uh, project in our department. Uh, so uh, the environmental touch of chemical engineering is huge. It really is. There's so every time I speak to any of our professors or students, I learn so much more about what's possible. It's just amazing. Um, Valerie, we had a question come in, and um, if anyone else would like to add to this as well, that would be great. But what's the difference between a chemist and a chemical engineer? Would you mind answering that one for us? Yeah. Oh, actually, I, funny enough, I was just talking to some chemists last week, so <laughs> I was. Uh, um, I'm looking for somebody to help develop the, you know, the chemistry steps in synthesizing something so that uh, we could use it in our applied work. So chemical engineering tends to be a lot more applied than chemistry. They might do a lot, lot more discovery. So I had asked him, you know, what are you interested in getting out of a collaboration? And, and he was like, well, <laughs> um, it has to be like a new kind of reaction that I've never seen before. I have to, you know, be able to develop some novel uh, synthesis pathway that doesn't exist. So I think they tend to be more discovery based, um, but that's not to say that they don't do any applied work. It's very, um, you know, it's, we're very open to interdisciplinary work, particularly in our department. Almost everybody, I think, pretty much works with someone else from a different faculty in some aspect. So we're very interdisciplinary um, and other departments like chemistry can be too. Okay, excellent. And would you say, um, like, what would you say from your perspective as a chemical engineer, are the benefits in pursuing chemical engineering versus a science program? Um, and where do you see the research sort of opportunities diverging? Um, 
I'm probably a good person to ask that because I come from a science background <laughs> and I came to chemical engineering later because I was very much a uh, interested in more applied research. And so what I wanted to do was very like, I want to see my research, you know, go out there and affect people in the next, you know, 10, 20 years. Um, whereas I think on the biological side, they're much more driven by that kind of discovery aspect. They just want to, you know, discover how this works. Uh, and rather than for me, I don't want to discover how it works. I want to make it work. <laughs> so for, for me, it's, it's the applied part that brought me to chemical engineering. Awesome. Thank you, Valerie. Would anyone like to add to that before we move on? I think you covered it really well. Okay, um, we're going to move on to some questions about co-op now. Quite a few questions have been coming in. Um, so I'd love to ask Suman and our students and um, get a little bit more information about, um, Suman, maybe we'll start with you and then we'll go over to Emma and Kingsley as well. Um, but Suman, could you tell us a little bit about some of the co-op roles you had when you were a student and how that maybe led you into the direction that you took when you graduated um, to where you are now? Co-op often has a big role on the direction that you'll take for your career path. So can you tell us a bit more about your journey and what that looked like? So um, most of my co-op positions were research related. So I took some um, co-op placement um, with some of the faculty members at Nanotechnology Engineering um, during my co-op, as well as I went to um, some government labs as a research assistant. Um, so I really could experience broad um, fields of um, research areas from like biomedical to nanomechanics to something like um, statistical analysis of the mechanical da data. And I also had opportunity to um, work at a startup company um, working towards um, water filtration system using um, new types of science. So um, my like broad research experience during the co-op really led me to pursue PhD later on. So it um, really depends on the interest and it can um, develop your career as well. Um, I was able to develop um, really good research um, publication records that really helped me to go to graduate school later. Excellent, thank you, Simon. Emma, can you tell us a bit more about some of the co-op jobs that you've had and the direction that you're planning to take after graduation? Yeah, for sure. So my first job, like many nano engineering students, though not all, was in research on campus at Waterloo. And that was in the um, oil spill treatment job. And that really gave me a good background in what research in a lab hands-on with chemicals looks like. And then that led to my second job, which was also in research, but in Taiwan on perovskite solar cells. And that was a really great opportunity to travel during my degree. And um, a lot of nano students end up having an international experience, whether to the States or abroad over their co-ops. And then my third co-op was really influential for me, which was in industry R&D at Teledyne Dalsa which is where I worked on image sensor fabrication and design. So um, I think I would like to pursue a career in a similar field in the future in industry R&D. But I know that to get the sort of job that I want there, I'd like to go to graduate school. So that led me to, in my most recent co-op, my last one, I went back to research at MIT where I worked on um, perovskite solar cells again. And I'm currently in the process of applying to graduate schools for next year. Excellent. Thank you, Emma. That's very exciting. And Kingsley, can you tell us a bit about your experiences in co-op? For sure. Um, I'll start by saying that I think co-op, in addition to being um, a great opportunity for getting work experience, um, is another great opportunity to help narrow down your research interests and in discovering what you're interested in and sometimes discovering what you're not interested in. Um, so for me, I guess my mindset when choosing my co-ops was trying to pursue fields that I thought were exciting. Um, so my first co-op was actually with uh, Ting's group. Um, I did research with Ting for a summer, had a great time, and we were working on 
the cell morphology, or rather the, how, how mammalian cells will conform to uh, various nanostructures. And that was in pursuit of my interest in you know, how biology might interface with materials and electronic devices. And over the course of um, you know, my academics and taking different classes, that, that interest was developing further. And then I tried to gear my, my co-ops and other extracurriculars towards that. Uh, so then I did some co-ops and startups working with material side and getting some more hands-on lab experience. I then worked in uh, biosensors for eight months, um, working on allergy detection and creating a new platform for rapid diagnostics. Um, and then most recently, uh, I mentioned at the beginning in my introduction that I, I was working in, uh, I worked at a company called Twist Bioscience in California. Um, and we were working on trying to adopt the DNA biomolecule for data storage purposes. So, um, which is kind of this sci-fi fantasy out of this world sort of idea where why on earth would you ever think to use DNA as a, as a computer or as a way to encode information. But those are the types of um, projects that really interested me. And I pursued that. And then along the way also, um, outside of co-ops even, I, I took some opportunities to do some design team work and, um, and, and got, got a real good taste of molecular biology and synthetic biology and, and got to spend some time hanging out with Mark and Val as well. It um, had a lot of fun there. And, and again, just to reiterate, along all of these uh, co-ops and design teams and internships were uh, kind of in, in service of uh, trying to learn more about what I was excited in and, and uh, get more experience and, and see where you can take this field and, and what directions you can go uh, forwards in. And then to conclude, as I come to the end of my undergrad, uh, I'm also looking into graduate studies. Uh, so I've applied to uh, schools in Canada and across the States. And the main reason for that is um, a lot of the research and development work that I've done in my co-ops, um, I've noticed uh, have they, 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 there, there seems to be a need for additional, very rigorous, not, not so much rigorous, rigorous is the wrong word, but ex more extensive and more thorough training in, in both research skills and you know, communication and stuff like that. So that's the path that I'm looking down uh, and yeah. Fantastic, that's awesome. Um, you mentioned design teams. So maybe you could tell us a little bit more about that. And um, if Val or Mark wants to add to it, and then I would like to go to Dylan as well to talk about extracurriculars and finding balance. But can you tell us a bit more, what's a design team and how do students get involved in those? Absolutely, it'd be my pleasure. Um, so design teams are essentially in a form of extracurriculars that are open. I, I would say they're primarily geared towards engineering students, but of course they're open to students across all faculties, which I think is actually awesome because you get to meet students not only from other engineering disciplines, but uh, you can work with students from the math faculty, the science faculty, the environment faculty, arts, health science, and so on and so forth. Um, so the specific design team that I worked on uh, was iGEM, which is the International Genetically Engineered Machines. And that is actually supervised by Mark and Val. Um, so we had a lot of fun uh, over the years uh, working on various projects in synthetic biology. Um, and then apart from iGEM, I won't speak too much on that because there's a whole bunch of different design teams you can work on. Uh, a lot of them are, are working on like alternative fuels, there's robotics, there's satellites, there's rocketry, there's, uh, there's a concrete canoe, or, or there's a concrete toboggan, it's one of the two. Or maybe there's, there's both. There's both, yeah, there's both. concrete yeah. canoe and toboggan, <laughs> and all seasons. Yeah, so there's, there's, there's design teams for everyone and, and across all the faculties. Um, and, and honestly, it's just, what are you interested in? And if you're, if you're interested in cars and batteries and, and that such, then there's, des there's a design team for you if you're interested in robotics. Really great opportunity, like I said, I'm, I don't want not to, I'm starting to sound like a broken record, but um, lots of opportunities to learn and go deeper in things that you're interested in, as well as learning from other students, because let's say you're in chemical engineering um, you might not have a very strong background in, in software, for example. Well, if you join a design team, you might be working with mechatronics engineers or software engineers, and that's a great opportunity to learn from them and learn together. And at the same time, you can share some of your background in chemical engineering or nano with the others. So I think it's a really, really great environment for collaborative learning. Um, and ultimately, engineering is, is 
heavily built upon that and working with other people from different disciplines. Um, was there anything else I should talk about, Daniela? Or, or maybe I, I think I'll, maybe that I'll was great. I, no, that was a really thorough response. And I think you hit a lot of the key points and the benefits of design teams. I, Mark, did you want to add anything to that? No, I, I was going to say uh, to everybody out there, um, I, I think Kingsley is a great example of what you can become. Uh, you know, th what he just uh, talked about is, is, is so true. And what I'd like to kind of emphasize uh, about what he said was that, you know, you might think that uh, a team uh, looking at uh, Formula One race cars is really only meant for mechanical engineers. And, and that's not true. You can, you can have multiple passions, right? You can, you can work uh, in chemical engineering and not have anything to do with cars though there are aspects that, that, that could touch on cars, but it doesn't have to be. But you can also uh, do work on a team uh, that, is, that, that, that does work on cars and you can, you can gain that additional experience. Um, you know, you, there, there are so many from, and, and, and to be fair, there are a lot of different car teams uh, from Formula One all the way to the Midnight Sun uh, solar car team. Uh, but there are so many different activities that you can uh, take part in, uh, and it's a great way to, to sort of round out. You don't have to do everything in one area, right? You, you can touch a lot of things and explore while you're at the university, and, and that's fun and exciting as well because, you know, th this, is, this is the time to try th things out and to get to know um, what you want to do. You know, I, one of the best things that I think Waterloo has to offer is that it, it kind of gives you a taste of, of a lot of different things before you exit the university. And that is also complemented by the fact that we have the co-op program. You know, what you do on your first work term, you might not ever do ever again. Uh, and you might not even get a chance to do it ever again, uh, nor maybe that you want to do it ever again. But the fact that you, you've gained that experience uh, is something so special and something that, you know, years later, you're going to say, wow, you know what, that was, that really was a unique experience that I got to experience because I was going through the co-op program of Waterloo. I mean, uh, I, I, I hate to um, kind of um, age myself, but uh, now I, it's, it's been over uh, 25 years uh, since I started my undergraduate degree. But I did my undergraduate degree at, at Waterloo, and I still talk about those co-op work terms that I actually did as an undergraduate student here at the University of Waterloo. So, um, yeah, I, 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 as you can see, I talk a lot, but uh, uh, I'm very, very, very passionate about um, the, the stuff that I, I get involved with. And I, I can tell you that at Waterloo, I've had all the opportunities in the world to touch all the different passions that I've uh, that I actually have. Awesome, like that, Mark. I hmm? talk about I did my undergrad at Waterloo too in co-op, <laughs> and I talk about my co-op jobs all the time. I did some some very different things that I I would not do again, but they were really cool and uh, helped me figure out what I wanted to do, which was to be a professor. That's a great point, Valerie and Mark. And I've actually hired nanotechnology engineering co-op students and chemical engineering co-op students, and they're working in very different roles that they're having great exposure to different things. So I think as Kingsley was saying, the possibilities are endless uh, when it comes to co-op and the design teams and some of the extracurricular opportunities that we have as well. Um, so there is there is lots to do and experience for sure. Um, Dylan, I did want to ask you to talk a little bit about your extracurriculars and maybe how you found balance as a grad student. Uh, sure. Uh, so um, as it's been talked about the last few minutes, extracurriculars are a really good way to integrate yourself into the academic society and meet new friends or colleagues that you might not otherwise meet. Um, but in it does come with some stresses and that you do have to be pretty good at time management. And as each time you go from high school or to undergrad or undergrad to grad school, you always uh, met with the transition phase more or less because you get more and more freedom as to what you can and do with your own time more or less. So really find what extracurriculars you think you'll enjoy and try and stay with it as much as you can because 
when you get in situations where you're stressed out, like during exams or midterms, you're really going to want that support network or that relief of stress to get your mind off for a few hours or just to get you through the day, so to speak. I unfortunately, I only had about six months at Waterloo before everything went into COVID. Uh, I was trying to volunteer a lot. Um, the last volunteer opportunity I had was with the uh, uh, Lego Nation. We, they were doing a robotics uh, Lego competition on campus with uh, public school students. It was a really neat experience uh, and I love Lego, so it was a win-win for me. <laughs> awesome, thank you, Dylan. Um, we were getting a few more questions in um, just around some of the um, electives or specializations that are available in nanotechnology and chemical engineering. So Ting, I was wondering if you could answer that question for us. Are students able to um, specialize or take any electives or how does that work within nanotechnology? Okay, yeah, sure. Um, there are, well, actually we're required to take eight technical electives. Four of them has to be in the ten, uh, nanotechnology program, and then the other four you can take it in other uh, faculty of engineering uh, programs. So with approval from uh, the associate director. So the whole purpose is you can actually broaden um, your knowledge, not only in nanotech, but also experiencing in another field. You can take some electrical engineering, which a lot of students did that. And then you can also take some in mechatronics uh, or mechanical uh, engineering department. So you will have the core as the elective in nanotechnology fields, and then you can actually branch out and get some more experience and get some more interdisciplinary experience in another department, which is always come useful. Um, uh, when I was a student, I did the same thing. Actually, uh, my the university that I was in kind of required us to take it someplace else. At the time, I would say, why would I want to do learn something in some other engineering discipline? But interestingly, like a few years later, when I get a real job, I say, well, I'm so glad I take some, uh, some other courses in some other disciplines, some other engineering program. So you, you kind of broaden your visions and um, also make sure that your background is much more solid, actually, uh, come to look back at it. Um, so, and uh, surprisingly, I, I don't know, uh, I took like a whole year of uh, college biology. Uh, and at the time I said, why in the world do I do that? But now, um, with all these coverts and all these uh, uh, medical uh, field kind of keep on expanding, I'm so glad actually I spent a year took some biology class. If not, I have absolutely no clue what's going on uh, other than um, just go to butcher shop. That's why I have so much biology I can know. So I'm, I'm pretty glad that I spent some time in college, uh, take some electives in some other department. And uh, as I mentioned before, um, in nanotechnologies, uh, you can take as many as four different um, uh, classes in some other engineering discipline. Um, so it's pretty flexible. And, um, and actually I answer some questions, uh, also post some uh, links so students can also look at it um, because at least it's so long. Even for the elective in nanotech, there are 20 different classes. And then when you expand even further for the entire faculty, uh, that's like a lot of different websites to go through. Uh, but I, I did post uh, in the, some of the questions, um, uh, the answer on some of the questions. Excellent, thank you. And Kingsley, maybe you'd like to add to that from the student perspective on some of the electives that you've taken. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, as I mentioned before, I'm in the nanotechnology department, um, but I've actually taken two electives in chemical engineering. Um, and the reason for that is whether you're in chemical engineering or nano or any other engineering discipline, the electives that are offered in your home department are plentiful, but they might not necessarily always cover your specific interests. So for me, myself personally, there were two courses in chemical engineering that I was really passionate about that I thought were really, really strong complements to my own personal interests. Um, so I branched out and I, I took uh, two of my electives. One of them was in bioprocess engineering and the other one in electrochemical engineering. But again, both of those were in the uh, chemical engineering department. And that on top of the uh, nano electives that I was taking and all together, those were helping me to specialize in kind of the fields of you know biology and, and electronics and that interface. So it's very flexible regardless of what program you're in. And, and, and again, it's just all about what you're interested in, what you want to pursue and the opportunities that are available for you. So. Awesome, thank you, Kingsley. 
And Valerie, did you want to speak to how it works within chemical engineering? If, is it similar that the options are there or uh, run a little bit differently for chemical engineering undergrad students? I think I will ask Mark to answer that because he's been around a little bit longer. He knows a lot more details about the undergrad program. So there's, uh, there are three broad categories of specializations in, in, in uh, chemical engineering. Um, and, but, and you get these specializations by uh, choosing your technical electives. Now your technical electives actually only start in your third year, um, but they can focus anywhere from uh, polymer engineering uh, to uh, bioprocess engineering to um, uh, even control engineering. So one of the aspects that we haven't really uh, talked about uh, in, in all of our discussions is, is how uh, chemical engineers are uh, really involved in um, the control of uh, manufacturing. I think Valerie uh, alluded to this early on in one of her first statements where she was talking about the quality of, uh, of, of things that we make. How do you make things reproducible? And well, uh, you know, one way to make it reproducible is to have tight controls and to have systems that are able to either detect um, and uh, manipulate um, the overall process so that you, you actually have a uniform um, and, and, and a reproducible product. And, and, and chemical engineers play a big role in that. It, the basis of that is, is really uh, mathematical. And so uh, if you are, are uh, really keen on um, uh, modeling processes or, or creating mathematical representations of, of things that actually happen, that is something that we actually do in chemical engineering. Um, and that would be an example of where you can specialize uh, in, in, in chemical engineering. Um, so there, there, there are uh, a number of different ways. It usually starts in your third year uh, and in your final year, you, you have a lot more choice because that's where you, you sort of uh, have all the basis to kind of um, really explore those different areas uh, that, that you can actually go after uh, as a chemical engineer. Awesome. Thank you, Mark. Um, we have a few minutes left, so I would like to go around to all of our panelists now and ask you what advice you have for prospective students. They've got a big decision ahead of them. Um, you know, they're applying to different universities and it's, it's a big pivotal moment in life. Um, so I'd like to ask what advice you have for these students when they're making their decision, choosing a university, um, and maybe what it is that you love about either chemical engineering or nanotechnology engineering that drove you into that field. Um, so Ting, not to put you on the spot, but if we could start off with you. I think you're just on mute there. There we go. Oh, okay. Um, so <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question. Um, so what, what, what I always tell the, or the, I mean, a few students asked me before when they're in high school, uh, which major, which department should I choose from? Um, I, I would ask that, I would tell them, um, just do something that you have passions about. Like you, you, you don't want to do something, just say my dad say you can make a lot of money on it, but you don't like it. Then, then that's not a really good reason. You, you need to go for a something that you really enjoy. You can get up every morning and you cannot wait to take a class. You cannot wait to think about that because that's what you should think about. That's the passion, what you like the most. And um, industry come in cycles. Um, sometimes the employment will be high and the combine will be low. So don't worry about it. Eventually you will have your chance to get a really high pay, but make sure that you go into something that really, really enjoy. The last thing you want is you get out of the bed, say, oh no, it's nine o'clock. I need to go to work. <laughs> that's, not, that's not a way to live. So, so that's what I always tell the other students. Don't worry about money. Go through your passion. You like it. You enjoy it. The rest of your life. That is to uh, eventually you the the, the the employment cycle will come to your way and you will be all set. So um, that that's the only thing that I I think the most important thing the students should think about it. Like say how to uh, get excited every week with this department with this program. You can be excited. So if you find it, that's your passion. 
then you should go for it. Then you enjoy the rest of your life. Awesome. Thank you, Ting. And your passion for nanotechnology engineering shines through, that's for sure. Um, Tiz, do you have some advice for future students and as they're making their decision about university? Okay, good. Uh, Ting has said very good things about passion. I, I, it's very true. I completely agree with him. In addition to that, Waterloo is a great university. Uh, Waterloo Engineering, uh, come on, uh, we cannot compete with anyone, right? <laughs> uh, so great city, great university. Uh, you know, the city is wonderful too. It's not too big, not too small. Uh, rent is affordable as well as compared to our other competitors. So Waterloo is a great place. Um, our chemical engineering department, we have our own building. Uh, probably you can, uh, in nanotechnology, it's also wonderful. I will convince you if you see it. So uh, even the study itself, we are talking about four years, right? You want to live in a city that you enjoy, Waterloo is among those places. I love it. Um, I'm sure a lot of people will, will love it. Uh, so whether you decide to choose chemical engineering or nanotechnology engineering, come to Waterloo. We'll be happy to help you and support you. We have a great faculty in both uh, departments. Um, I'm very proud of my colleagues. Uh, we have so many uh, great people. Uh, so definitely we, we will be very happy to welcome you here and to support you as well. Thank you so much, Tiz. And Kingsley, can we go to you next? What advice do you have for future students? Absolutely. I'm, I, I'm of course, what Ting and Tiz said are 100% true. Um, to add on to that, I'd say um, when you're looking for a university or a program, um, my, my, I guess my recommendation would be to consider what gives you the most opportunities in what excites you. Um, and whether that's the co-op program that gives you opportunities or I, a diverse, a, like programs that are inherently diverse, like chemical engineering is inherently diverse, nanotechnology is inherently diverse, um, things that gives you the opportunities to explore and, and really find uh, what your interests are. Just because um, what you what you're interested in today uh, might change in a year's time. And you know, if you get super, super, super specific, and you don't necessarily want to lock yourself in in one kind of path, right? So, um, yeah. So my, my advice is consider keeping your doors open and, and looking for opportunities that let you um, find things that you're interested in that complements your your interests going forward. Awesome, thank you, Kingsley. And Dylan, you bring an interesting perspective to the table as a current grad student. So do you have some thoughts for future undergraduate students? Uh, yeah, I'd just say um, be flexible and open to uh, changes. <laughs> um, even if you are in a program and it's not going your way or you're not liking it, you, you have options, you're able to switch. You can find something that you're more passionate about, passionate about, even if you're just trying to get your foot in the door at the school you really want to go to. If you work really hard for a year and get really good grades, you can switch into the program you want. Um, so just be flexible and determined into achieving what you want to get out of the best opportunity that you can get. Okay, thank you, Dylan. Uh, and Suman, would you like to share from your alumnus as a graduate of Waterloo Engineering, what advice do you have for future undergrad students? Um, I would say um, experience as much as you can. Um, even if you don't know like what interests you right now, um, you can experience different fields and different things through the labs that um, Waterloo offers, as well as the core program. Um, and it can really develop your interest during your undergraduate study to um, choose your career in the future. And I think one of the, that's one of the merits of um, doing undergrad at Waterloo. Definitely, thank you. Emma. Yeah, my main advice for um, for high school students is that like, at this point, you should really not feel stressed or underprepared for a degree in nano or chemical engineering. I see a lot of high school students that are worried that they might be behind if they don't know how to program or haven't done a lab internship and they know someone else who has. Just know the vast majority of high school students don't have experience in those things or very little. And beyond basic high school math, chemistry, and physics, 
and physics, you have all everything you need to excel coming into the program. Excellent advice. Thank you so much, Emma. Valerie. So I would say for those of you who don't know what your passion is yet, because I was one of those people when I went to university, <laughs> I had no idea what I wanted to do. I, I literally was debating between going into biochemistry or fine arts or engineering, and I had no idea. So I picked something I was good at. Um, and I think you can get a lot of enjoyment out of something that you like that you're good at. Um, and it took me a while later, I, I discovered that chemical engineering was really my passion. So this is where I ended up. And now I'm super passionate about it. But I know a lot of high school students and even like first year students often tell me I have no idea what my passion is. Um, and I think that's okay, you know? So be flexible, like a lot of people said, and uh, there's lots of time to develop that kind of stuff. That's a great point, Valerie, thank you. And Mark, if you could finish us off, I think you're just on mute there. Yeah. yeah. So one of the things that I'd like to, to, to kind of put in perspective uh, for doing um, your studies at Waterloo is that when you come to Waterloo, you join a big family. Uh, and uh, what I mean by that is that unlike most other liberal arts school where you have a lot of choice and flexibility about where you go in terms of what courses you take every term, we, we work on a cohort system. And so everybody's going through the same thing. And so this cohort system means that, you know, there's a group of, uh, of, of, of engineering students and it may be in your program or in a, in a, in a sister program you're all going through at the same time. And so the, at the end of the five years, you have a really close community. Some of my best friendships uh, really uh, started in first year and they were able to, to like be nurtured and, and, and grow just because we experienced very similar things as we went through. And it's that support network that is really uh, truly awesome about engineering at Waterloo because engineering at Waterloo, people will tell you how it's a tough program, but you know what? It's not so tough. And the reason it's not so tough is because you really have that network around you that is going through the exact same thing. And because that support network is there, uh, we get through it and you end up being so much stronger uh, as a result. You know, Val and I both uh, went through here at Waterloo and we both left Okay, after we finished our undergraduate degree, we left when we went to different cities and we went to different schools and look where we ended up <laughs> back in Waterloo. And, I, and it's not, you know, uh, because we had no other options. <laughs> it's because Waterloo is really a, a good place to be. Uh, and it can be a good place for you as well. And so uh, I, I, I encourage you to, to think hard uh, about your choices. And no choice is wrong. You can, you, you, whatever you choose, don't feel bad about your choice. Uh, you will, um, you're going to, you're going to do well, no matter what you, you decide to do. Um, but Waterloo provides great opportunities. Uh, and um, I hope that, that we will be able to share in those opportunities with you. Okay. So that's all. Thank you so much, Mark. And, and I would like to say thank you to all of our panelists uh, who are here today. I think your responses were very helpful and we were able to get through a lot of the questions from our attendees. So thank you so much for being here. Um, in the chat for our attendees, we did share a link um, to register for an ENG chat. ENG chats are a program that we have with current student ambassadors. So if you have more questions about chemical engineering or nanotechnology engineering, I would like to speak one-on-one -on -one with one of our student ambassadors from one of those programs, you can register for a chat there and they'll schedule that at a time that's convenient for you. Um, as well, if you have any general questions, uh, feel free to email us anytime at enginfo at uwaterloo.ca. Um, and check out our website. There's lots of great info there as well if you've got more questions. But thank you all so much for being here today. We really appreciate it. We hope we're able to answer some of the questions that you had. And please do get in touch if you've got additional questions. Thank you, everyone, and have a great evening. Take care. <laughs>